Buddha once said that all he taught was suffering and the end of suffering, or stress and the end of stress. A problem and its solution. That's all. All the teachings in the canon, all 84,000 sections of the Dharma, focus on this one problem and its solution. You don't do the problem, the problem is already there. It's the solution, though, is something you have to do. That's the phrase in the chant just now said, Antagyuriyaya, to make an end. It's to make an end of suffering, make an end of stress. So all his teachings are directions on how to do that. They're part of a training. They're part of the Buddha's instructions on how to bring about an end of suffering. We tend to forget that. We sometimes take the teachings out of context. They become part of a philosophy, a worldview. So many people can argue and discuss. But that wasn't the Buddha's intention. Each of the teachings has its place, has something you do, or directions on what to do, even when it's a matter simply of analyzing suffering, analyzing its cause. He analyzes it so you can understand it, and then you act on the understanding. So the teachings have their value, and it's their purpose is in training the mind. A lot is said about Buddhist wisdom. Three characteristics, teachings on emptiness or dependent core arising. But when the Buddha himself defined wisdom, it was the wisdom of how you do something, taking that knowledge and putting it to use for its intended purpose. That wisdom begins, he says, with a question, what, when I do it, will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness? It's that one question that forms the framework for everything else. He also said that the measure of a person's wisdom, whether you're to be a wise person or a fool, was measured in two situations. One, there's something that when you do it, you'd like to do it, but it's going to lead to suffering. You have the wisdom to be able to convince yourself not to do it. Or if there's something you don't like to do, but it's going to lead to happiness, you have the wisdom to be able to convince yourself to go ahead and do it. This is wisdom in action. And that's the kind of Buddha wisdom the Buddha was interested in. So when you think about his teachings, always think about how they function in training your mind to undercut the cause of suffering so you can lead to the end of suffering. For instance, we're working with the breath now. You're focusing on the breath coming in and going out. The teachings on the Four Noble Truths, the, all the various ways of expressing the path, relate to what you're doing right now. So the important thing is what you're doing. And then you pick up those teachings as they become necessary, as they become useful. But the first thing is to get the mind to settle down. The Buddha once said, right concentration is the heart of the path. And his most detailed instructions on meditation, or his instructions on breath meditation, watch the breath, he says, as it comes in and goes out. Be mindful and alert. When it comes in long, know it's coming in long. When it comes in short, know it's coming in short. And that's a shorthand for all the other things the breath can do. It can be fast or slow, heavy or light, deep or shallow, comfortable or not. 
If it's not comfortable, you can change. Nobody's forcing you to breathe in any particular way, so you might as well breathe in a way that feels good. If you want the mind to settle down, and to train it in the direction where the Buddha says the mind settles down, there's a sense of ease and refreshment. Again, you can start right away by making the breath easy, refreshing. Feels good coming in, feels good going out. And the next step, he said, is to train yourself to breathe in and out, aware of the whole body. You can do this section by section, if you like. In other words, be aware of the abdomen for a while, then be aware of the chest and the head and the back, the thighs, the shins, the feet, the shoulders, the arms, the hands. Make a survey of the body to make sure that it's comfortable, that the energy flow in the body is unobstructed. And you can go through that bot body survey several times, as many times as you like, until you're ready to settle down. You focus your awareness in one spot, and then think of it spreading out to fill the whole body. So you're aware of the whole body breathing in, aware of the whole body breathing out. And then you can allow the breath to grow calm. As you find after a while that the sense of energy in the body feels just right, you don't have to breathe all that much. The more quiet the mind becomes, the less oxygen it uses, and the less breath you're going to need, or less in and out breathing you're going to need. Think of all the pores in your skin opening up, and the oxygen at the, at the skin. The oxygen exchange there is enough to keep you going. These are the first steps in getting the mind to settle down, to put it in a place where it can start using the Buddha's different teachings. Say on the three characteristics. You find anything comes up that distracts you, anything that creates a burden on the mind. And no matter how much you bring your mind back to the breath, that particular distraction is gnawing away. So the Buddha said, focus on its drawbacks, the drawbacks of thinking about that kind of thing, of identifying that as a thought that you want to get involved with. Right here you can begin to use the three characteristics. In other words, notice how that thought comes and goes. Or if it's a pain, notice how the pain comes and goes. Once you've created a good, steady foundation for the mind, you can look at pain and not feel so much threatened by it, and then you can watch it coming, going, and realizing it's not the solid torment that you might have thought it was. It moves around. The same for those distracting thoughts. They come and they go, they change. So watch the change. And then make a comparison, the mind when it's still and at ease with the breath, and then the, the mind when it gets involved with the pain, when it gets involved with the distraction. And you see that the pain and the distraction are stressful. And if they change and they're stressful, why claim them as yours? That's one of the ways in which you use the teachings on the three characteristics. The Buddha taught them not as a treatise on the nature of reality, but as a tool for prying loose when any, any kind of clinging you may have. You start with blatant things that are really distractions. Anything that comes up in the meditation that disturbs your concentration, that can disturbs your stillness, you can apply those teachings and then pry the mind loose from its attachments to those things. Then it gets easier. If the thought happens to come back, you can, you can really ignore it. You don't have to get involved. 
and you find that by not getting involved you begin to starve it. It has less and less energy. Then as your concentration gets deeper and more solid, you begin to see more subtle distractions, more subtle disturbances in the mind, even in the concentration itself. When the mind is really still, it can use those same three characteristics as tools for prying those more refined attachments. That's why the teachings are there. So keep this in mind. The Buddhist teachings are best understood from this perspective, from this perspective of a still mind. Alert, mindful, inquisitive. In other words, when there's a disturbance that comes up, you want to look into it to try to understand it. Just enough so you can let it go. And this way you're using the, the Buddhist teachings for their intended purpose. So that you're capable of making an end to suffering. It's just one problem that the Buddha focused on. That's it. The problem of suffering. But it's a big one. This is the problem that makes everything else a problem. Whatever other problems there are in the world is comes down to the fact that they cause suffering. So you can train the mind not to suffer. Then that takes care of every other problem there is. <laughs>